Welcome to the fifth and final installment of the 2021 Legends of Simpson faculty lecture series. This virtual series has featured some of Simpson College's most beloved Emeriti faculty. Today, we conclude the lecture series hearing from Dr. Bruce Haddix, who began his tenure at Simpson in 1969 as a professor of philosophy and history. Haddix served as academic dean from 1994 until his retirement in 2006. He also served as interim president from 1998 to 1999. It's now my pleasure and honor to introduce a Simpson legend, Dr. Bruce Haddix, as he presents the liberal arts in a post-truth era. Dr. Haddix, everyone. Well, thank you, Andy. I appreciate very much uh, being asked to be a part of this lecture. And I thank you for starting it. I think it's been interesting to hear what some of my former colleagues have had to say and what they're doing now, and it's great. Before I begin my lecture, which is just a fairly short an analysis, uh, I want to say thank you for folks out there who are tuning in to listen and ask that if there are any former students out there um, listening, that um, I'd appreciate it if you'd uh, contact me and let me know where you are and what you're doing. Uh, I've been retired now for 15 years, and before that, I was 12 years in the dean's office. So it's been almost three decades since I was full time in in the teaching uh, faculty position. And uh, I'd just like to hear from you. So if you could send me a quick email, just tell me what you're doing and where you are. Uh, I'd, I'd love to, I'll respond to you and I'd love to hear about it. Second thing I want to say is um, a word about my talk today. Uh, ever since I came to Simpson way back in 1969 in the Department of Philosophy and Religion, I, um, I've been interested in liberal arts. Uh, I came to Simpson because it was a liberal arts college. Uh, and I remember the end of my first year, Dean Wally Weiser asked me to talk to incoming freshmen about the liberal arts. And for all these many years, I and many other of my colleagues, Owen Duncan, for instance, Todd Lieber, other people, uh, have worked on what it means to have liberal arts, what it means to develop a curriculum, et cetera. So the, the whole issue of liberal arts is, uh, is dear to my heart, especially these days when I think the liberal arts are under a great stress and attack for lots of reasons, mainly uh, monetary reasons, uh, the departments uh, that uh, support the, the strongest, the liberal arts, are, are being cut because uh, it seems like the only way we can evaluate departments anymore is the number of majors, et cetera, number of credit hour production. So uh, it's an issue for us. And um, I've tried to uh, deal with that a little bit uh, in my lecture. The other thing I want to say is that it's a short lecture. There's not too much you can do in a short time. So I've tried to focus on one or two points about the liberal arts, and there are many other things I have not addressed. So in the question and answer period, perhaps somebody can ask some questions that raise uh, things that I've not spoken to, like what is uh, unique about a liberal arts college, or how do you develop a liberal arts curriculum, or whatever, uh, things about the post-truth world. But I've uh, entitled my lecture, uh, the liberal arts in a post-truth world, which is a fairly uh, pretentious title, but on the other hand, I've been accused of being a fairly pretentious guy over the years, so what the heck. Well, to my lecture, the liberal arts in a post-truth world. It's commonplace today to hear talk about a post-truth world. Now, this is simply a shorthand way of saying that truth in any objective way is no longer possible. There are a lot of reasons for this. For instance, there's no agreement about what is true. And furthermore, there's no way to commonly decide what is true. Furthermore, there's a lot of people that believe there's no such thing as truth in the first place. What we have in the place of truth are simply claims. Claims that are sometimes supported by evidence, sometimes not, but essentially what they are are claims backed up by someone's passion or perhaps anger 
uh, or whatever else he or she wants to bring into the discussion. One interesting example of this recently was the argument over the Georgia presidential election. Did Joe Biden win Georgia or did Donald Trump? Both sides claim they won. Both sides claim truth about their position, but only the Georgia election officials presented evidence for the truth of their claim. The other side, the Trump side, rejected that evidence. And they claimed, uh, at least in part, that there were 300,000 votes that were missing or ignored. No evidence was ever presented for that position. The claim itself seemed enough for millions of people. And even today, I'm shocked by how many people still believe that. Now, what was so frustrating to most of us who went through this was that the evidence presented by the Georgia officials for instance, there were three recounts done. Uh, the paper ballots uh, correlated with the voting machine tallies so that the voting machine seemed to be working okay. And uh, the uh, uh, officials all through the state of Georgia, which said that the election worked well and was uh, fairly valid, all of this was simply ignored by the other side. The position was that Trump won, fraudulent election results were never investigated. All the Georgia officials evidently were in on the fraud. In other words, the claim was enough for many, many people. And more importantly, the claim formed the context for understanding everything else. It reminded me of the old story about the man who believed that he was dead. No one could talk him out of it. He lay in his bed, dead to the world. Finally, one doctor asked him if dead men bleed. And the man answered, no, dead men don't bleed. So the doctor cut the man's finger and produced blood out of the puncture. Now, what do you conclude from that? The doctor asked. Well, I guess dead men do bleed, the man replied. You see, the, the claim provides the context for whatever evidence is presented? And how does one go about getting to the truth when evidence to the contrary is either ignored or interpreted within the purview of the claim itself? When reality becomes subjective to what I think and therefore distorted. Now, this issue is not new. In one sense, it's as old as Western civilization itself. Plato, I remember, I know you all remember Plato. Plato argued that most people lived with opinions, not knowledge. And it was extremely difficult to change opinions. No appeal to evidence would do any good. Remember, he pictured people in a cave chained and facing a wall, things were going on behind them and all they saw were the shadows of what was going on behind them. Ev new evidence was no good because new evidence was just shadows on the wall. What was needed, Plato said, was they had to be loosened from their chains, turned around and somehow got out of the cave. You see, this struggle to find truth and knowledge is an old one. However, I think it's become a crisis in our time. It's become, for some people, institutionalized. 
we do not seem to have the ability, the wherewithal, to not just agree on what is true, but to agree on how we might go about finding out what is true. Everyone seems to be stuck within their own views, within their own small worlds. Everyone seems happy with their own opinions and they claim truth for them. Now, what has this got to do with the liberal arts? I know it's no surprise to anyone that I believe the liberal arts is precisely one of the things that's needed in our time of turmoil and confusion. And I wanna see if in the next few minutes I have in this talk to explain why I think so and how liberal arts can help us deal with our present situation. 15 years ago, time flies, in my retirement lecture at Simpson College, I tried to address what I thought the liberal, liberal arts are at their best. And I began by using an example I borrowed from Fred Beekner, well-known religious thinker and novelist. If you out there have never read Fred Beekner, I recommend uh, any of his books to you. Well, Beekner gave as his example of art, he was talking about art in this particular passage, a haiku poem, an old haiku poem. And the poem goes like this. An old silent pond. Into the pond, a frog jumps. Splash. Silence again. That's the poem. Now, Beekner comments, quote, the poet makes no comment on what he is describing. He simply invites our attention to no more and no less than just this. The old pond in its watery stillness, the kerplunk of the frog, the gradual return of the stillness. End quote. Beekner goes on to say that what the poet is doing is putting a frame around the moment. And what the frame does is enable us to see not just something about the moment, but the moment itself in all of its ineffable ordinariness and particularity. Let me repeat that. The frame enables us to see not just something about the moment, but the moment itself. Now, if we'd been walking by the pond when the frog jumped, we might not have noticed anything at all. Or if we had not made much of it. But notice what that frame, the haiku poem does, is that it sets the pond and the frog off from everything else that might distract us. You see, the frame does not change the moment, but it changes our perception of the moment. It makes us notice that moment in a way that we would not have noticed it otherwise. Now, what Beekner was saying about art gives us real insight, I think, into understanding not only the purpose of the liberal arts, but how they work. To be specific, let me just say that just as the poem framed that moment with the frog and the pond, so liberal arts frames. It makes us stop and notice things about the reality that we live in. 
it frames the physical world. So we notice nature in all of its aspects, physical, organic, chemical. Perhaps more importantly for our purposes here today, it focuses our attention on aspects of ourselves that we've not been aware of. It frames for us, it frames us as humans. It frames our humanity. It frames our common human world. It makes us concentrate on the concreteness, the particularity of our lived experience. And furthermore, it enables us to notice ourselves, to understand ourselves and our world better. You know, I've found that most of us, and certainly students, are great with abstractions. We, we really are pretty good with abstractions. What's difficult is to concentrate on the concrete, what is actually before us. And if you think I'm exaggerating, ask any teacher of writing. We can write about abstract ideas, but to write about the absolutely concrete reality that's in front of us is hard. So the liberal arts forces us, I think, to notice concretely the world we actually live in. And furthermore, in the end, hopefully, it even challenges us to practice our humanity with more integrity. Let me give you an example of a young man who went off to college many years ago. He was a fairly smart young man. He did quite well on tests. That's what we mean by being smart. And he earned academic scholarships to go to college. He had the world pretty much figured out, at least the general shape of the world. It was a world of opportunity. It was a welcoming world. It was a world with no limits. Pretty much a positive world. Of course, there were some things about the world that he uh, learned too. It was a world where the races uh, should be kept separate for everybody's good. It was a world where men and women had quite separate roles to play in life. It was a world where gays and lesbians should remain in the closet, not only for their own good, but for the sake of society. Now this boy was fortunate enough eventually to attend a liberal arts college and he was provided a liberal arts education, a pretty good one. He took classes where what it meant to be human was framed for him. He was forced to notice it. He had to read books. He had to write papers. He had to engage in certain conversations. For instance, he was given the opportunity to really notice how race operated in America. He was forced to read uh, Arnold Rose's book, The Negro in America, which was a sort of condensation of uh, Gunnar Myrdal's famous work on race in America. He was uh, made to notice what women's roles did to women by way of Betty Friedan. He even began to notice how the closet affected the mental and physical health of gays and lesbians. And furthermore, he noticed how he had come to believe things which now he knew were suspect or wrong. He saw how he was being shaped by the society he grew up in. And uh, that society he saw had, uh, was racist and misogynist and homophobic. In other words, this young man learned to be critical, 
not just of other people's views, which we're, we're great at that. I mean, hey, I didn't even have to be taught to be critical of other people's views, but he learned how to be critical of his own views as well. In other words, he began to be educated in how to understand himself and the world he lived in. He began to see glimmers of truth about himself that he had never seen before. And he left that college prepared to continue to figure out the truth about himself and the world of other people, to continue that for the rest of his life. I'm assuming that's what he's still doing. He was in truth a changed person. He was no longer content with just his own opinions. He had a thirst for more than just his own views. Now, how did this come about? By learning more, yeah, he learned a lot of details, a lot of facts. By confronting views other than his own, yes, boy, there were a lot of views other than his own he had to learn. But mainly in his classes and in his discussions and in his papers, he was called upon to notice things, to take note of what was in front of him, to notice who he was, who others were, what kind of world we live in, who the winners and losers are in this world that we've constructed. And once in a while in some courses, he was forced to notice that winning and losing are sometimes greatly overrated. So my point with this story is that the liberal arts frames for us our lived experience. It frames our world, it frames our humanity, and it invites and equips us to notice all kinds of things about ourselves and our humanity. For example, when I take a history course, say Western Civ or American history, I'm forced to notice that men and women always, always act within the context of the world that is given to them. We have an expression, he was a man of his time. That's right. And so is everyone. So are you and I. But we notice the truth of that truism when we study history. We notice how people, all people, are shaped by the world, the society in which they live. Abraham Lincoln was born in a time and place that thought Black people to be inferior. And he reflected that in many of his statements. He was a man of his times. And yet in our history course, we also, as we notice how events unfold, we also notice that what a person does, how he or she responds to that world that shapes him or her, actually makes a difference to what happens next. Lincoln interacts with the world that is given to him, the world of slavery and racist ideology, and he begins to change it, to reshape it. Yes, we're all men and women of our times, but our times are also shaped and reshaped by how we act. For instance, if we reinforce the world we're given, if we say yes to it, it becomes more entrenched. If we act to reform it in some ways, then the world is changed, perhaps dramatically, as in the case of Lincoln or Martin Luther King, perhaps just ever so slightly as in the case of most of us. But the truth is, we learn by noticing history that our actions are always shaped by our society and our society is always shaped by us. Peter Berger calls this 
the paradox of social existence. And the discipline of sociology at its best is designed to frame and analyze that paradox for us. The truth is we are historical beings. We share an inner subjectivity with others at a certain time and in certain places and history courses at their best make us notice that as well as teach us facts and names and dates and stories. We learn the truth of that old saying, all history is autobiography. But to notice our embodiment in time and place is more than just noticing our behavior. It's also to obtain a sense of our interiority. We are interior beings as well as active persons. We have emotions, we have impulses, intentions, conscience. And I think the study of great literature more than anything else frames our interior lives for us. It helps us to see others and ourselves, not just as objects acting, behaving, but as complicated beings who both appear to and hide from each other. And we notice how often our appearance and our insides are at odds. Literature frames for us, our, us as story-shaped persons whose intentions often go awry and whose acts almost have unintended consequences, many of them destructive. What leads us to act the way we do? Why do we feel and think the way we do? Well, the social sciences frame for us the psychological forces within us and the social shaping forces working upon us. And we could go on and on and talk about each discipline in the college, the natural sciences, the arts that frame for us the, our imagination and how we create and construct the worlds of our imagination. Even business courses frame for us certain aspects of our lives. They frame how we order the world economically. Each of these disciplines is in the business of making us notice ourselves and our world. Now, there are certain disciplines, I think philosophy and religion, for example, that try to frame the wholeness of our being human. These courses help us see that we're not just a collection of fragments, but we experience wholeness, unity, at least at times. And I think religious studies in particular tries to characterize that unity, to frame it for us, to inquire into the character of that unity. Suffice it to say, that the liberal arts at their best produce men and women who are more aware of themselves and the world and other people who are both like them and different from them. Liberal arts people are not interested just in what they believe, but also in why they believe it and whether what they believe might be wrong or right. And furthermore, they're interested in how we begin to figure out the answer to all these questions. In other words, liberal arts people are not only critical thinkers, they're self-critical thinkers. They're not just satisfied with having beliefs, they continually want to explore what those beliefs mean and whether they are adequate to their experience. And furthermore, because of the liberal arts education, they have the resources to begin to deal with these issues. A post-truth world is a world with very little interest in inquiring whether what I believe is worth believing. I believe it, 
It's good enough. It makes sense to me. But we all know that simply won't do. Not if we're trying to understand the world we live in. How many times have we discovered that what we used to believe was wrong? It no longer fits our experience. The truth is, I've discovered that a lot. I've had to reshape my beliefs, change my opinions, scrap many ways of doing things. And I do that because what I formerly believed simply will not work anymore. When faced with my new experience, with faced with what is in front of me, when I notice the concrete world I actually live in. In other words, those old beliefs I now see were not true. The post-truth world is just another way of talking about ignorance, ignorance, ignoring what is before me in my experience. But the liberal arts, if it's working as it should, forces me to notice, to take account of what is there, and it helps me assimilate it into a better, more adequate, dare I say, more true account of things. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now I'll turn it back over to Andy. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, what a great lecture. And uh, what we'll do now is open it up to questions and you can submit your questions through the question and answer box. And I will present those questions to Bruce. Uh, the first one that has come in is you've mentioned that if you had any of your, your past students to send you an email, what email would you like uh, people oh, okay. to send? Well, it's BB Haddocks, Bruce and Betty, BB Haddocks at Gmail. So it's pretty easy to remember, bbhaddocks at gmail. That'd be great if I could hear from a few people. I'd love to do it. As I say, it's been many years. One of the things that maybe while people are thinking about questions, sometimes uh, it's hard to think of questions when you off the top of your head. But um, one of the things that I didn't talk about in my talk is that, you know, I just talked about what courses do, and of course. Um, Every school in the country has history courses and literature courses and social science courses, all the courses I mentioned. What's so unique about a liberal arts college? And uh, I think to me, liberal arts colleges have a mission that um, certainly are in, in part of our mission is to try to prepare people to go out in the world and survive to make a living. We wanna prepare people for careers, for vocations. But our mission also is to allow people to do what I'm talking about in the liberal arts, to become good citizens, to become careful and self-critical thinkers, to be able to contribute uh, to this um, quest for understanding the world better. And, and so we shape a curriculum that, that emphasizes it, that sort of um, makes it, um, more evident that what we're doing in classes are not just giving them information, not just teaching them how to do things like skills, but also teaching them how to focus in on the world they live in. So I think that's unique to liberal arts colleges. Hey, I'll start going through some of these questions that have come in. Okay. And the first one is, does the future of the liberal arts call for the recovery of some aspect or part within the tradition? an original contribution? And if both, where do the bearers of the liberal arts turn? Well, yeah, the answer, of course, obviously, is we have to rely on our traditions. And I think one of the, the great things about liberal arts colleges and the great thing that the education that I got from, uh, from a liberal arts college is that um, there are more traditions that that have affected me than I knew. Uh, in fact, one of the great contributions of the women's movement, of the, of the minority movements in our country, the black uh, movement, uh, the uh, uh, 
Hispanic movement, all these uh, movements that we have is that there are traditions in our country that have affected the country that I didn't even know about. I mean, I went through high school without even knowing that there were uh, uh, black intellectuals, except of course I heard of George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington, that's it. Um, well, there's a tradition there uh, and uh, the, the tradition, the contribution of women, et cetera. But yeah, we rely on the tradition because we're part of an ongoing tradition. We're part of a living tradition of folks who are trying to figure out what's the nature of the world is and who we are. And uh, so I would say, yeah, and that, that's our, we have a great responsibility. That's why I hate to see um, departments, particularly in the humanities, but other departments too, in the arts, uh, being cut back for, uh, you know, I understand there's great financial pressure, but we're going to pay a price if we think the only goal of college is to prepare us to have a job. We lose something about our, our humanity in doing that. I don't know if I answered the guy's question or the woman's question or not, but uh, that's the best I can do with that one. Well, uh, this next question is actually a great segue, and that's you know the importance of the liberal arts. How do we go about uh, impacting our world so that it promotes liberal arts? It's kind of becoming one of those things where um, it's less and less heard of or common, especially looking at the students that will be attending liberal arts institutions. Um, how, how do we get into those high schools and how do we make liberal arts a more uh, common term uh, that people understand what it truly means? Yeah, boy, that's a, that's a tough, that's a good one. And it's an important one. Uh, there's two things in there involved, it seems to me, as I heard the question. One is, I heard it yesterday on, uh, on uh, Terry Gross, maybe, or somebody, as I was driving along, an interview of, of a guy who wrote a book, was talking about how you change people's minds. And he, he was saying that uh, you don't, and I tried to address it in my talk, you don't change people's minds with facts. Because facts are always just either ignored or reinterpreted within the, the context that they're living. What the best way to deal with folks who uh, is to try to get them, just like we get ourselves, to think about why they believe what they believe, what, what's behind what they believe. Uh, and uh, that's a sort of a liberal arts move, isn't it? We, we're not just interested in what we believe, but why we believe it, whether what we believe then is worth believing. That's one. The second thing is when we're recruiting high school students, we want to recruit them on the strong majors we have with the possibilities of internships and what they can do after they leave Simpson in terms of careers or vocations. And I think vocations are more important to push than just careers. But we also, you know, most students don't want to just perform for the man. They don't want to just dance for the man. Uh, they, they want to be, uh, they want their lives to count for something. And uh, one thing about liberal arts is it, it helps you explore your worth, your meaning. Uh, most people, you know, most people in the humanities uh, who major in the humanities don't come to school wanting to major in the humanities. They take a course and they, it, it's meaningful to them and they decide to major in that. I always say, well, if you want to major in philosophy, that's great. Now, what's your second major? because <laughs> you're going to have to do both in order to survive in this world. You, gotta, you can't make a living in a philosophy shop down on the square. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't major in philosophy because you're, you're going to be thinking about your worth, your meaning, what the world is. So I think we have to appeal to that as well. And I feel like sometimes we only appeal to the practical nature of our education but boy, boy, I used to, I remember saying, speaking to a group of incoming or, or, or a prospective students one time about how what I taught was useless to them. It wouldn't be useful to them. And uh, everybody laughed nervously. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, the reason why people laugh and think, think I'm just kidding is they equate usefulness with worth. 
Um, what I teach might not be useful to you, but it's going to be worthwhile. And people want to have, live worthwhile lives as well as useful lives. And I, you know, I think when we appeal to those things, we're doing liberal arts work wherever we are, whether we're admissions people or whether we're old guys sitting around at the coffee shop. Thank you. If students today believe history or literature is written by dead white males, how can today's liberal arts professors convince them otherwise? <laughs> well, a lot of history was written by dead white males, but you know, there's also history being written by live white males, by live black males, by live Hispanic males, by live black women. Yeah, uh, I think what we have to teach students, and if a good history teacher does that, in addition to teaching the actual history, is to teach them what history is. History is an, is an attempt to try to recollect our past. And the more we diversify that um, collection, the more we bring other people into it, into the discussion, we, you know, black, I mean, old, dead white men uh, are important. My father was a dead white man. So I'm not going to run down dead white men. But the point is, there's more to learn from than just dead white men. There's well, women, there's blacks, there's Hispanics, there's Asians. So I think what we need to do is to teach people that all of us, no matter what our gender or our race or whatever, are trying to recollect our past in order to understand what who we are and what we're supposed to do. Because we don't know what to do unless we know who we are and what our purpose is. So, you know, somehow or other to get into students' minds, the notion that history is fundamental to them being human, instead of just names and dates. And I, you know, I always, I always appreciated Owen Duncan for that. I think that's what he was trying to do in his history classes. That's why I learned a lot from Owen on that. All right. I appreciate what you're saying about how the liberal arts frames the world for us. I think the church does this too. How is this framing similar and how different between liberal arts and the church? Yeah, well, they're connected, you know. Um, the church uh, at its best and liberal arts at their best are trying to uh, just to uh, what we call elicit humanity. And uh, so there's a, they both have that mission. And uh, probably the church, church's mission is, um, is probably um, what, it, it's more a, of a redemptive nature. I mean, the, the liberal arts don't baptize people, the church does. Uh, but there is a commonality. There's a there's an overlap there, I think. And church related colleges, I, I really think, uh, try to live with that overlap. That's why I've always I went to a church related college when I was a student, and uh, taught. And Simpson is one. Uh, so I've spent my life in church related colleges, and I'm very much appreciative of that overlap because I think we have a religion, a mission that's not only educational but in sort of a way, religious. Okay, and we'll only have a chance to get to one more question here. So for all of the others that have submitted questions, thank you. Um, I apologize that we cannot get to those uh, immediately here, here but um, as Bruce said, feel free to email him as well and, and start a conversation. Uh, but we'll end with uh, one final question, and that is how do we help people want to be reflective so they can be open to the truth? Or is it finally up to whether they want to change or not? Yeah, boy, yeah, that's right. If you know, if somebody's just not receptive, uh, you, you, it's a tough one. But the, I always, I mean, as a teacher with students, uh, that was always a problem. How do you get people to reflect? You try one thing, you try another. I think, I think at bottom, I mean, Aristotle was right. People, uh, Aristotle said people by nature want to know. And, and I think that's right. I think people want to know. 
and um, even folks who, uh, who who don't seem receptive, if you stay with them and ask enough questions, and you know, I was always uh, accused of asking too many questions, but quite I ask questions to try to get people to see if they could begin to understand, explore them. I wasn't interested in just telling them facts. I wanted to get their, I wanted to get them out. You know, my theory was come out, come out wherever you are. And if they'll come out and try to explore something, then um, they become reflective. I mean, you can't come out and engage another person without being reflective. You have to be. So if you can get them out into a kind of a common conversation where we not just talk about what's true, but we talk about how do we figure those things out and what, you know, then, then I think we're being reflective, but it's a, it's a tough one. If anybody had the answer to that question, he'd be a billionaire. Well, thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Haddix. It's been a, a real pleasure listening to you today and, and giving us some insight that we can possibly reflect on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and uh, to our, our guests that are, are with us today too, uh, thank you for, very much for being a part of this, and we definitely hope to see you uh, next year when we host the 2022 uh, Legends of Simpson Faculty Lecture Series. I hope everyone has a, a wonderful day. Thank you much. Thank you.